Hello and welcome to the webinar. My name is Josh McDaniel. I, I work with the Wildland Fire Lessons Learn Center. I'll be introducing the speaker, uh, Gary Ochtemeyer, here in just a minute. And I'll also be moderating the question and answer session after the presentation. But first, I want to make a qu few quick notes and a few uh, quick announcements. Um, First, I want to point out that the webinar series is sponsored by three organizations, the, the Wildland Fire Lessons Learn Center, the International Association of Wildland Fire, and the Joint Fire Science Program. I've put up some links here to their websites, and of course, I want to invite you to, to, um, to uh, explore some of the, res the, the growing number of resources all three of these organizations are starting to produce. Also, I wanted to announce, or to present some of, uh, announce some of the upcoming webinars. Um, there's a few that we already have scheduled and one that we're, we're quickly narrowing down. But we're um, uh, developing an expert panel webinar on heat stress injuries among wildland firefighters. And we're hoping to have that later this month. Um, we uh, should be finalizing the date and time here pretty quickly in the next week or so. And so I'll uh, be looking for an announcement on that. On May 22nd, Terry Jane is going to present results from a recently completed synthesis for the for the Joint Fire Science Program on field treatment practices in ponderosa pine, dry mix, conifer forests. And then Nicole Vaillant is going to present two webinars, one in June and another in July, covering um, uh, some new tools that she's been working on with, with a couple teams on uh, field treatment planning. The first one covers arc, arc fuels, and that'll be at June, on June 7th. And the second one will be in July, covering landscape treatment designer, and that'll be July 12th. There's a few others that we're working on. We haven't finalized uh, titles and dates and that sort of thing, but you know, we, we, we try to get the announcements out. And, and if you would like to be on our email list, if you if you came to this come to this webinar from somewhere else besides our email list, um, I'll put in my email address up towards the end of the webinar, and you can contact us, and we'll get you on that email list with the announcements. All right, and you can reg and just another note, you can register for these webinars on the Advances in Fire Practice webpage. And there's the link that you, I don't think I want you to type that in, but if you Google Advances in Fire Practice, it'll take you there, or you can go to the Wildland Fire Lessons Learn Center website and navigate your way there um, using the menu. Okay. Okay, so now on to today's webinar. Um, I'll introduce the speaker in a second and get started, but first I want to let you know how questions work, and we encourage you to put questions, you know, to type questions in early and often. Um, we will try to get through all of them at the end of the at the end of the session as long as we don't start wearing Gary out but we will just type them in and we at the end of the webinar we will we'll try to work our way through the questions um, that should be in your control panel it's either depending on what type of system you have there's a box that says questions or chat and you can type your questions in there okay and also the webinar is recorded and archived and that link is up will be up on the advances in fire practice webpage um, shortly after the webinar, as soon as we can get it uh, uploaded. All right, so I will now, first real quick, we want to um, find out who's out there. So there's a couple polls. I'm going to launch just to see who the audience is. So if you can respond there. Uh, it looks like a little bit different of a, a little bit different of a mix for this webinar. Um, so, 38% federal land management agencies. I would say our normal webinar, normal webinar in our webinar series gets about 60% federal land management agencies. So, quite a big contingent from state and local, um, quite a bit from from others. So, I didn't uh, capture another large group in there. It looks like. All right. Mm, second question. And yes, I realize that these are you know limited number of categories here, and overlap in a lot of these. A lot of people do many wear many different hats, but um, the, we've got five options. And that's what we came up with. Okay, so um, uh, a large contingent of firefighters and fire managers, and also another large contingent of land managers. That's that's pretty typical of our webinars. And then, but it looks like there's another group there we're not capturing there, so. Um, maybe in your uh, the survey that comes out at the end of the webinar, there's some open answer, 
open-ended questions. You can type in what, you know, give us some information about uh, what organiz organization you're from and what um, uh, um, what your uh, job title is, and we can get a sense of what's out there. All right. Oh, I didn't put that up. I didn't share that. Wait, sorry about that. Okay, so there's the results. Um, so that should take care of the housekeeping. And just a second, I'm going to turn it over to Gary Ochtemeyer, but first I want to introduce him. Uh, Gary Ochtemeyer is a research meteor meteorologist with Southern Research Station with the USDA, USDA Forest Service. He's the past director of the Southern High Resolution Modeling Consortium and the past team leader of the smoke management team located on the University of Georgia campus at Athens. His research focuses on time-dependent modeling of local smoke transport at night over complex terrain, modeling smoke di dispersion from wildland fires, regional scale air quality, super fog, and modeling fire spread and mountain winds via cellular automation. So welcome, Gary, and I'll turn the screen over to you now. Okay, am I on board? Yeah, just take uh, control of the screen there, and that should, uh, should be up and running. Okay, I, I think I have it. Okay, uh, well, uh, <clears throat> I'm Gary Ochtemeyer, uh from Athens, Georgia, and I also want to welcome you all to the webinar, and I hope that what I have to present will be of interest to you and, um, and also educational. So. Let's go from there. Um, Gary, your, uh, I... your uh, presentation hasn't come up yet. What hasn't? No. Let me know when it does. Hmm. Now let's see if. I'm going to switch it back to me and then switch it back to you again. Okay. Okay. Ah, uh, here we are. Show my screen. Okay, that didn't come up in the previous one. There we one. go. We're now we're going. Up. Okay. All righty. Okay, all we have to do is, uh, there we go. Okay, um, once again, uh, welcome to the webinar, and um, I'm glad to have you all on board. Uh, we're going to be talking about the causes of smoke uh, induced fog and its movement over the landscape. Uh, the material I'll be talking about uh, I have obviously as a primary focus in the southeastern United States, where this is much more of a problem perhaps in most locations out west because we have more roads in forested areas and uh, we do a lot more prescribed burning here and we also do our burning during the wet season of the year which is January through March and uh, so we have the right combinations of events that can lead to smoke induced fog. Uh, the site that no land manager wants to see is um, an automobile accident uh, pile up on a major highway that is um, uh, related to a prescribed fire that uh, he has been involved with in some way. And uh, these are just some of the headlines that have come across over the past uh, four or five years even as this is a continuing problem in the southeastern part of the country. Uh, almost every year, uh, several people are killed and a number injured from roadway accidents caused by smoke and fog on the highway. Uh, the culprit is usually smoke from residual smoldering combustion in the wake of prescribed fires. And I says has on rare occasions. And it, uh, I don't want you to think that this is a common event. It's really a fairly rare event uh, given the number of prescribed burns that are done annually in the south. Uh, literally tens of thousands of prescribed burns, and there may be just a handful of these that uh, lead to 
uh, smoke fog problems. But when they do occur, um, there's a combination of the smoke of the fog that creates extreme visibility reductions. Uh, local winds uh, transport this uh, folk smog, uh, smoke fog mixture across roadways. Um, there often result accidents, some of which are multiple vehicle pileups, causing loss of life, injuries, and extensive property damage. Uh, land managers uh, are faced with losses due to litigation and also issues of conscience of having initiated actions that resulted in injuries and loss of life. So this was a serious problem in the South and uh, I was brought in by the U.S. Forest Service Research Program specifically to work on this issue. And that work began in 1990 and I thought I would just take you through some of the, the history of this project. Uh, what has been developed and uh, land managers who have been involved with us at various times during the development. Uh, since this is such an uh, important issue for those land managers who are involved with prescribed burning, there's been an eagerness to uh, collaborate with us and help us direct our research in a way that's most beneficial to them. Uh, this began as a nocturnal smoke project. Um, the charge was to understand the movement of smoke at night, first over the Piedmont of the southeastern United States, then over coastal and mountainous areas, and to find ways to alert land managers to the dangers of smoke and fog being generated in the aftermath of their burns. By answering this question, and this is a question that was posed by land managers, if I burn tomorrow, will I smoke up a road tomorrow night? Uh, that question was reduced to three research questions from which the basis of the research began. The first one is where does the smoke go? The second one is how much gets there? And the third is what kind is it? Uh, the first part of my presentation is going to be devoted to that first question, where does the smoke go? Uh, if we can't figure out smoke transport, there really isn't much use of trying to answer the other questions. So we need to have some scheme, some model that can uh, follow the movement of, of smoke over the landscape in the southeast or in any other areas of uh, similar terrain. Um, under the conditions that lead to uh, smoke fog incidences. So this led to uh, the efforts to develop a wind model uh, to predict winds over complex terrain with shallow valleys typical of the Piedmont in the southeastern United States. Typically ridge, valley, elevation differences of 50 to 150 feet. Um, also uh, part of the problem was that the model that can do this has a considerable amount of mathematical complexity. and. Um, at the time that the model was uh, initiated, uh, the computer resources available uh, were woefully inadequate. And so the development proceeded under the uh, assumption that by the time it was finished, that computer resources would be sufficient to run the model operationally. And that indeed has happened. Okay, as most smoke fog conditions occur under near calm conditions, I knew in advance that wind data from nearby weather stations would be useless for predicting smoke model or smoke transport. And so we had to completely change the paradigm and develop a model based on winds driven by a combination of synoptic and what we call, uh, which would be large scale weather systems and, and drainage pressure fields. Otherwise, from a meteorological standpoint, it's differences in pressure that cause the air to move from one location to another. Uh, this is kind of an example, very simplified, of circulation around a, uh, of a large-scale high-pressure center that might cover part of the southeastern U.S. In the daytime, the, uh, uh, the wind tends to blow parallel to the slope of the, uh, the high-pressure system. And uh, this is due to a, a complex um, combination of forces which are uh, driven primarily by the, the, the pressure gradient or the difference in pressure uh, from one point to another across the high pressure center and the earth rotation. 
and uh, near the ground, uh, friction comes into play, and so the wind doesn't blow exactly parallel uh, to those contours, but basically blows a little bit from high to low pressure. But at night, uh, a number of factors come to play, and the uh, friction near the ground slows the winds, and uh, this reduces the impact of the Earth's rotation, and so the winds tend to blow more radially from the high toward the low pressure. And it was interesting to talk to land managers who have done prescribed burns, and, and oftentimes say, you know, we watch the, the smoke blow from south to north during the course of our burn, just as we planned, and then about sunset, we notice the wind start to turn and start blowing from the southeast. And, uh, and they know, so they notice the wind shift begin to take place. Well, this is uh, this transition from the daytime to the nighttime wind flow. And then the other uh, contribution to this model is uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the drainage winds, the pressure fields that drive the winds from you know, downslope into the basins. So during this period of time, um, a model was developed called the Slow Nocturnal Airflow Model, or SNAF. And uh, then it was combined with a particle emission model uh, to create PV Piedmont, a wind model for trans smoke transport along the ground at night. And the term Piedmont, well, the PV means plan burn. And Piedmont, of course, is the, um, uh, the um, landform uh, of the southeast uh, where most of uh, our uh, operational forestry work is, is done, say, for the mountains. Okay, so uh, then, uh, okay, you've got a model developed, but uh, we don't know how good it is until we can get some uh, data to input into this model to understand what, what the, the, uh, uh, the contributions to the wind field are, and then also to validate the model. And uh, this is where our um, collaborators uh, really uh, helped us out. And this is 1994, the Georgia Forestry Commission and private landowners uh, collaborated with me to uh, uh, find uh, some, some land uh, that had been clear cut and uh, we could set out wind instruments, temperature instruments, and we also had a tethered balloon that could be raised about 500 feet above the valley floor to get temperature profiles. And we found that uh, rates of cooling, uh, we found rates of cooling after sunset along the slope. We found a vertical profiles of temperature every 20 minutes. And we found that the transition from the daytime conditions to the nighttime conditions took place in about 30 minutes. So it was just boom like that uh, from about the time of sunset that we went from typical daytime conditions to these drainage flow, drainage driven type conditions, it was extremely rapid. And from this information, we were able to develop the pressure forces needed to drive the slope drainage winds in the model. Interestingly enough, the first test of the model uh, was on an uh, automobile accident that occurred in Ohio uh, in February of 2000. I had been contacted by a uh, uh, well, this is in 2000, I guess, when this was done. Uh, this is um, uh, their, their domain, uh, basically a community uh, burned Christmas trees every year at a location uh, the city owned or the town community owned uh, in, in a valley. And uh, this blue line here represents a stream that flows along the valley. And um, they never had a problem. Uh, this is Interstate 70 right here that crosses the valley about a half mile south of the burn site. And you can see from the embankment here that the highway crosses uh, fairly high up above the valley. It turned out on this particular day that um, they burned their Christmas trees. And when it got toward evening, uh, the, the fire was still burning. So they put, it, put the fire out with water. And that created a lot of smoldering. And uh, then during the course of the evening, the drainage winds formed. And you can see by the little arrows here, uh, little barbs that indicate the direction of flow from north to south, basically down the valley. And uh, this is, um, uh, uh, well, of course, the contours, I believe, are every, uh, three, uh, every, every five meters. 
Uh, so it's a fairly steep uh, valley on this side and sort of a shallow valley on this side. And what you see are the depths of the, um, of the uh, nocturnal boundary layer. Uh, it's basically about 30 meters or 100 feet deep uh, in the central part of the valley and about 10 meters deep or about 30 feet deep up here on the flatland. And then right here along the uh, embankment of the expressway, you can actually see the air flowing over the roadway and the embankment, uh, almost like uh, water flowing over a submerged rock. And uh, there's a, a, a trace of smoke which is blowing down towards the uh, expressway here. But winds in this area become light and variable. And so the model said that, wow, I've got a lot of smoke that's been accumulated here. But what happens is as the, uh, in the course of the evening, as the drainage flows get better organized, uh, this smoke starts drifting toward the expressway. And at 11 uh, p.m., uh, there's this uh, tongue of smoke that's crossing the road uh, just west of the uh, bridge over the stream. It turns out that that was the location of the accident as well. And so that gave me kind of a warm, fuzzy feeling to recognize that, gee, this model I developed might be useful after all. Uh, then another uh, part of the validation of, of PVP Mont occurred. Um, uh, this was done in 1996 with collaboration with the uh, U.S. Forest Service Okmoge National Wildlife Refuge in western Alabama. Uh, its location was an isolated valley, and um, ground crews uh, soaked 50 bales of hay in diesel fuel, ignited it, got it burning, and extinguished with water, which produced a whale of a lot of smoke. And then I was on board an aircraft that was equipped with a uh, light sensing uh, camera, and uh, we overflew the valley, and you can see here's the burn site, and the smoke was blowing actually up valley in this case, turned into a side valley. There's a low spot in a ridge right here that uh, the smoke crossed. Uh, what we didn't know and didn't really understand or recognize was that this, you are looking at super fog. Uh, the crews on the ground knew what had happened, and um, I guess I, I just wasn't far enough along in my understanding of super fog to, to know what caused it. Uh, but this is the first photograph that I have of, uh, of a super fog event. Then uh, from 1998 through 2005, um, the second part of, this, of the validation of the model, which was also smoke tracking. And uh, this was the Department of Interior, Piedmont National Wildlife Refuge in central Georgia and the South Carolina Forestry Commission were very much involved uh, in helping us uh, with this data. Uh, in this case, uh, PB Piedmont was required to place smoke where smoke was observed by burn crews who drove the roads at various times during the night after the prescribed burns. And I gave them smoke reporting forms, which they filled out their location and the time and what they saw regarding, of, regarding the smoke and they reported that back to me for each burn. This is an example of one of the burns. Um, this is an early primitive uh, graphic uh, which shows the elevation. I, I want to point out for you people out west that these are not snow-capped mountains. Uh, basically, the elevation difference uh, between this ridge top and this valley is about 150 feet. So you have uh, kind of a high-resolution terrain drawn here. The blue lines represent roads, and the numbers represent locations uh, that the crews stopped at at various times during the night to uh, take observations. What you see here is um, uh, at, at 6 p.m. in the evening, uh, basically a plume of smoke uh, being carried toward the southeast uh, by, by winds blowing from the north about northwest about maybe 10 miles per hour. And uh, so there's, and this represents only the, the 10 meter deep layer. So we're not looking at smoke that's higher up. We're looking at smoke which is moving along the ground. But later on, uh, during the night, as the winds died down and drainage winds took over, you have an entirely different uh, smoke regime. And what you see here are observation points at 8 o'clock the following morning. And the circles represent, uh, red circles represent 
uh, where smoke was observed and smoke was predicted by the model. Uh, the triangles represent misses. Uh, this area right here, uh, no smoke was reported. Uh, this area up here, smoke was reported. And this rep rectangle represents the burn site. Uh, for uh, This work was done for 20 burns, and that comes up to 270 uh, individual smoke reports by the burn crews. And so what we did was we just put this up in a little simple matrix, uh, smoke prediction versus smoke observation. And you can see that uh, the model did uh, fairly well, actually had about 77% per correct prediction. And if you note the numbers across here, you can tell that there's a bit of a bias in the sense the model was tending to underpredict the location of smoke. Uh, there were several reasons for that, uh, which I won't go into. Uh, this is a case in South Carolina. The South Carolina Forestry Commission uh, really uh, became enthusiastic and supplied me with a bunch of data. As you notice, this is a terrain which uh, there is almost none. This was done in the, in the upper coastal plain, and the land is very flat, so terrain was not that much of a factor and I wasn't too certain how well the model would work under this condition. Uh, what you see here are the boundaries of, of the uh, block of land that was burned with prescribed fire, and, and uh, here are the uh, plumes of particles being released by PV Piedmont being carried to the southeast. The three green circles represent key highway intersections that um, the, the, the Forestry Commission uh, wanted to defend. And, and you can see that at uh, 1700 or about 5 o'clock on 9 February 2006, everything is working out exactly as planned. The smoke is, is drifting away in exactly the opposite direction that the uh, key intersections are from the burn site. However, by 8 o'clock the next morning, things had reversed. And the wind had shifted during the night. These winds are extremely light. And uh, what you see here is a different coloration between the yellow and the red. Uh, PV Piedmont has an algorithm that follows the relative humidity. And when the relative humidity starts getting close to 10 to 100 uh, percent, it flags the smoke dots as red, as indicating the possible co-location of smoke and fog. What you see here is a, <clears throat> is a 66 percent accuracy model simulation. Uh, the model hit on these two intersections, and smoke was reported at all three intersections. And you can see the model missed over here. Uh, this is about 200 uh, feet, I think, is, is where the model missed. Uh, but you can see the information that the model is giving to the land manager, that even though this intersection was not correctly predicted, it certainly raises an alarm that things could be going wrong in this area. So. Um, anyway, that is uh, uh, a case of, of a 66%. Uh, for 12 burns in South Carolina, upper coastal plain, uh, this is the matrix that we got. 125 observations, 64% correct prediction, so the accuracy of the model dropped a little bit. And we notice this number here where the model underpredicted uh, the smoke. And, uh, we, and, and we saw a case for 66% accuracy. OK, what were some of the reasons for the errors? Uh, particularly in South Carolina, long stream valleys uh, extended through the full range of the model grid. Uh, this impacted the model's ability to develop uh, drainage flows. And uh, there's just nothing we could do about that. That's just luck of the draw. Uh, then there were events where um, the stronger, uh, larger scale pressure uh, systems were mixing down winds, blowing from different directions. Uh, this is especially the case in South Carolina where the upper coastal plain had very, very weak uh, drainage flows. Uh, no remedy for that, but it's a note that these should be cases when smoke's not a problem because that means the smoke's being mixed out by the larger scale winds. Uh, then smoke from distant burns. Um, we would follow a particular prescribed burn, and there were some cases where um, all of a sudden smoke would appear in a direction or you know, at a location where 
you know, we were confident winds were never blew in that direction from our burn site. And so we suspected that there were burns that were going on around and smoke uh, from those burns moved into the area. That happened in just a few cases. And then we had just a few cases where there was no residual smoke. Uh, the burns that were done were burned in grasses and uh, residual smoke uh, had gone out. But the model was, uh, was saying, okay, you know, we're assuming smoke is coming from, you know, all points within the uh, within a block being burned, and if and if this, if that's the case, this is where smoke is going, and so the model was predicting smoke, and there was none. Okay, uh, this is one of the burn crews, uh, the Coney National Wildlife Refuge uh, in Georgia. These are some of the folks that helped out, uh, staying up or getting up in wee hours of the morning and driving the roads, and providing me with data. And uh, they were really excited to get. One, uh, actually one of the first operational versions of the model. This is a case of me right here kind of guiding uh, one of the crew members uh, operation on how to use the model on his computer. Uh, this is a South Carolina Forestry Commission. Uh, had a larger training session uh, for these people. They had uh, several tables set up uh, with uh, computers uh, training their forestry people on how to use the model. and. Um, uh, these people were particularly enthusiastic about uh, further collaboration with us as we develop the model uh, for South Carolina. Uh, then another form of validation is accidents, and um, uh, I don't have a obviously a complete record for all the times the model has been used for accidents, but the record I do have is the model's doing pretty well. Uh, it's six for six on accidents. Uh, this is a case that occurred in um, February of 2011, so I guess it would just be last year. And this was in eastern Mississippi. And uh, you can barely see the um, outline of, uh, of the uh, block that was burned uh, right in here. And I should point out now that PB Piedmont is now linked with Google Earth. And so now you have a full image of, um, of the area with uh, the model output overlaid on that image, so it gives you a very good idea of where the roads are, you know, where buildings are, schools, and so on. Uh, right here was uh, where the accident occurred. Uh, during the course of the day, the uh, wind had been blowing toward the northeast uh, in the general direction of New Augusta, and then at night the winds went calm, and um, uh, the the uh, Land manager uh, determined that given the drainage structure here that the smoke would, uh, would remain in, in this drainage here, which uh, would go to the south away from the, uh, the major road here, US 98. Uh, this was at 4 o'clock uh, the next morning. And uh, you can see the outlines of the burn site. And yes, indeed, you can see uh, loads of smoke going down the drainage here uh, on the south edge of the burn site. But notice that there are two drainages to the north in which uh, uh, smoke uh, crossed the road. And the red indicates the model is saying uh, there could be co-location of smoke and fog in these cases. It turned out on, on closer investigation that there was a ridge line that runs right along here. So this far north northern corner of the block burn actually drained to the north. and, and um, and that is it, uh, provided the source for the smoke that got down to the accident site. Okay, then another thing that happened that really uh, spurred our work and made it possible to um, uh, get a model like PB Piedmont available for the land manager was the uh, the FCAMS, and I believe that's uh, Fire Consortia uh, for Atmospheric Modeling um, of Smoke and um, uh, our group here at Athens was the Southern, model, uh, Southern High Resolution Modeling Consortium, or we call it SHRMC, which is still operational. And um, as I point out, uh, as I will show, uh, you can get uh, the, the PB Piedmont model uh, from the SHRMC website. I'll provide that in a little bit. But we have 72-hour predictions of local weather, uh, National Weather Service weather data for baseline studies, and also access to the USGS 30-meter uh, digital elevation data which is necessary to run the model. 
So the current status of PVP Mod is available uh, to be uh, used. It's located on the loaded on the user's computer. Uh, this is the website that um, uh, one can get the model, and uh, plans are underway to uh, try to make PVP Mod a web-based application so that. Uh, you won't have to download it on the computer and manage uh, the data sets that uh, it's currently done now. I should point out that the current version that's available works only on 32-bit computers. Uh, this is bad news for those of you who have modernized and um, are getting Windows 7, uh, which is a 64-bit processor. I had one land manager who contacted me uh, who had downloaded the model and wanted to use it on a Windows 7 computer and uh, he couldn't get it to work. Uh, so this will be another area where the model will have to be upgraded. But if you happen to have uh, Windows XP, for example, uh, there's no problem with uh, running the model. Okay, let's talk a little bit about super fog. Uh, super fog is a very dense fog that reduces visibility to less than three meters. I chose three meters because that's just about the distance from the windshield to the road if you're looking out the front of your car. Uh, but descriptions of super fog reported by accident victims and responding officials imply visibility of one meter or less. And so what that means is that if you are in super fog uh, of this uh, density, you can hold your hand. Uh, straight out and you cannot see your fingers. The fog is so dense. Uh, the super fog in the, United, in the southeastern United States is almost always associated with wildland fire, but not always. Uh, there are other instances where super fog has occurred uh, not associated with wildland fire, but uh, it appears that this is really one of the major areas. I, I am aware of one major accident that occurred in northern Georgia that was not associated with wildland fire. Okay, this is um, an aerial view of the I-4 disaster uh, in central Florida. This was in 2008. Uh, what you see here is the, um, the six-lane expressway. Uh, this is where the, uh, the wildfire uh, that was um, burning had smoldered during the night and weather conditions became favorable for the formation of super fog. Um, this stuff is incredibly dense. Um, uh, probably, you know, unless you're a land manager who's been out and have experienced this stuff, um, those of us who haven't experienced it haven't an idea of how, probably how fearsome uh, this fog can be. Uh, these are trees that you see in this photograph. And uh, from, from this and other photographs, I was able to determine from estimates of the heights of the trees and how far the, the fog came up along the trees that this fog is about 20 to 30 feet deep. And so uh, you can see nothing. And uh, uh, right here is smoke from burning tractor trailers uh, coming out of the fog. Uh, you cannot see the tractor trailers. You cannot see the 70 cars that are involved in the pileup. Uh, this fog is just incredibly dense, uh, and, and, and as such, uh, motorists have no chance at all uh, when encountering uh, super fog. So what causes it? That's uh, the next part of our study is to think, okay, what kind of smoke is it uh, that gets to this location? Uh, studies reported in the literature show that air pollution augments fog formation and makes fog denser. The prevailing theory for super fog has been that smoke causes super fog because smoke produces huge quantities of cloud condensation nuclei, and these compete for the available moisture in the air, resulting in many very small fog droplets. The many small fog droplets scatter light more efficiently than fewer large droplets, and so you get dense fog. Well, I started working with the CCN theory and um, started recognizing there were some problems. Uh, first of all, natural fog very seldom reaches liquid water contents high enough to support super fog, even in the presence of wood smoke. And then uh, I took some trips in the field in fog, uh, in the presence of natural fog, and one trip actually took me uh, to the Oconee National Forest where uh, there had been a uh, prescribed burn done the previous evening, and now in the morning, the landscape is covered with natural fog. I got to the burn site and there was no fog. 
and I, I, I could see smoke uh, coming off, up from the ground and no evidence of fog whatsoever. And so that began to clue me in that perhaps something else uh, was going on that was more important. And that additional factor is smoke moisture. Uh, I want to uh, point out another collaboration, uh, some work that, is, uh, that was done from basically 2000 to 2007 for another project uh, where we monitored prescribed burns during the daytime. Uh, this was done at the Savannah River Forest uh, in, uh, in, in uh, South Carolina. And I call this my, uh, my poster photograph for uh, smoke advocates. Uh, you can see the rays of the sun shining through the trees, uh, kind of illuminating the smoke. Uh, you can see this blue hue, uh, which tells us this is wood smoke, that actually light is being scattered in the blue uh, frequencies. Uh, but what I want to call your attention to is this cloud down here. Uh, this uh, very shallow but very dense white cloud uh, lying along the ground. Uh, right over here you can actually see fire. I mean the, the, uh, the burn crews are just off moving up the road. And this was a first indication of super fog uh, in a prescribed burn, and, and uh, in, in close study of, the, uh, of this plume, the plume doesn't drift off and disperse, it drifts off and dissipates, and so it's, it's acting like a water cloud, not like a cloud of smoke. Uh, here's another view from the same burn, and you can see this white cloud that runs along the ground, and it's very dense. You can see the trees just disappear uh, into this, uh, this cloud. So this, uh, this photograph that was taken by a, a graduate student from um, University of Georgia who was working on this project with us uh, actually opened the door to say, wow, I think we kind of have an idea of what we should start looking for. So we started looking at smoke moisture. And we know that water is a product of combustion. And for three tons of fuel consumed per acre, the chemistry of combustion yields five, one and a half tons of water. If you add in the water evaporated from preheated fuels that are consumed, water evaporated from the ground, and fuels not consumed, uh, if the water equivalent released from these sources is just a hundredth of an inch, then a water release per acre is 1.1 tons. So we're looking at a lot of water here. And so that got us back out in the field uh, measuring the temperature and moisture of smoke from uh, smoldering uh, fuels. And so we measured, and we measured, and we measured, and, uh, and then in this case, um, uh, I scored big. This was actually a, a pile of uh, a mixture of um, uh, pine needles and uh, uh, hardwood leaves uh, in my backyard. And uh, this plume is super fog. And uh, you can tell even out at the edge, you don't see through this stuff. And it's a very small area right here that's producing the super fog. Uh, but there's absolutely no seeing through it. Uh, this is a temperature and relative humidity for this case. Uh, each time the instrument was put into the smoke, the relative humidity went to 100%. Uh, there were two temperature sensors, one high frequency, high resolution, the other uh, the instrumental uh, um, uh, temperature sensor uh, that kept track of uh, both the temperature and relative humidity. And so what this did was it gave us an idea of what was happening. And so this is really how this super fog thing works. Uh, what you're seeing here is a change of phase diagram for water vapor. This line right here represents 100 percent relative humidity. Anything to the left of this line is greater than that, and so the water uh, condenses into droplets. Over here you have water only in the vapor phase where the relative humidity is less than 100 percent. So you can take a certain temperature, and this is a measure of water over here. We call it mixing ratio. It's a meteorological term but it just basically measures the quantity of water in the air. So if you follow along this line where the moisture is fixed, you can, as you cool the temperature, the relative humidity goes up until you reach 100%. And then beyond that, if it continues, if it continues to cool, uh, you, you get fog formation. 
Or in the other case, if you have a constant temperature and you add water, you finally reach a point where your relative humidity goes to 100%. So what's happening? If you take an ambient temperature, in this case I use 10 degrees with a mixing ratio of 5 grams per kilogram, and so you can see where this red dot is, it's, it's below this, so this is not saturated. It's fairly high relative humidity, maybe 80%. Uh, and you take smoke, which happens to be humid smoke, uh, again, not saturated. Uh, and you mix the two, uh, you end up with a mixture, which is the average of, uh, of, of the two. And, uh, and that gives you a dot here, which is well inside the line for uh, formation of liquid water. The saturation mixing ratio at 30 degrees C is uh, 28 grams per kilogram. And so the difference is 12 grams per kilogram of, of water. Now this is a potential measurement. It actually never works out quite this, this bad uh, due to other factors that complicate the equations. But compare that with the liquid water content of natural fog. Uh, light fog forms with 0 0.01 grams per kilogram. Uh, cumulus clouds run about 0.3 grams per kilogram. And typically, uh, it, the, the super fog will run around 4 grams per kilogram. So we're still looking at 10 times higher liquid water contents in this, super, or in this fog, which is generated by mixing two air masses of different temperature and different uh, moisture. So this allowed me to develop a super fog screening model that combines smoke temperature and moisture with ambient temperature and moisture, and, uh, and then to uh, run it for several cases to see uh, uh, what's happening. Uh, this was a case for cool, saturated plume and unsaturated ambient atmosphere. So when the smoke left the ground, I started mixing with the atmosphere, uh, the uh, uh, fog formed, flashed into uh, super fog uh, very quickly, right at the ground level. Uh, and then as the smoke continued to rise, the um, uh, continued mixing with the unsaturated ambient air evaporation evaporated the fog. And by about six-tenths of a meter above the ground, the super fog had evaporated and you just had a rising smoke column. Well, this began to answer some questions that had been on my mind. This was a... Um, a, an aerial photograph of a prescribed burn being done at the Coney National Forest. And I was curious about these bright spots that had shown up in the smoke as it was leaving the ground. This is a fairly high plume here, but you can see it very easily here. And also here, there's almost like a, a top where the color of the smoke changes as the plume continues to rise. Well, this was the concept that we were seeing. That this smoke was actually flashing in the super fog but then as it rose, it very quickly dissipated in the smoke. You can see the same principle operating way back here in the background with the power plant and the cooling towers, where the uh, humidity is flashing into a, a, a cloud, which is probably super fog, and then it very quickly evaporates as the air continues to rise. Well, this was the I-4 case that we ran, and again, um, as soon as the, uh, the, the air mixed, in this case, it was an unsaturated plume, that we, we modeled uh, with saturated ambient air. There was natural fog that occurred on this night. And as the, uh, as the plume rose, uh, you have height over here. So as the plume rose, the uh, air continued to mix, and the uh, liquid water content went all the way up to 4.8 grams per cubic meter, which is extremely high. The, the plume rose to about 10 meters, and then the weight of the water just actually forced the plume back down to the ground. So the plume came back down to the ground and remained on the ground instead of being carried away. And this is the trace of time as the plume rose. It, uh, that part of the graph where the plume rises to 10 meters occurs only in a couple of minutes. But you see out here over 40 minutes it takes for that plume to get fully returned to the ground. And so you see this cloud that, it, that is laying on the ground uh, of this super fog. Um, and so all heat that would be in the smoldering here has been, uh, been contained within the fog and the weight of the liquid water just has pulled that fog right back down to the ground. Okay, uh, this year already we've had a, a very serious uh, accident 
uh, related to super fog. Uh, this was on the 29th of January of this year, just south of Gainesville, Florida. Uh, Ten people killed, 18 injured, uh, 12 autos, seven tractor trailers. Again, a site no land manager, manager ever wants to see. And, um, and so this case just raised a question in my mind. You know, okay, we developed a super fog screening model, but we still haven't been able to develop a really good mechanism to transfer this information uh, for use for the land managers. So uh, this uh, uh, case uh, kind of rekindled our interest, and uh, we said, well, let's look into the possibility of developing some kind of super fog index that could alert land managers uh, of uh, the potential for super fog in an area where their burns were taking place. Uh, this is the uh, temperature trace for Gainesville during the night the accident occurred. And uh, 72 uh, degrees at 5 o'clock in the evening, it cooled to 39 at 5 a.m. in the morning. And a couple of points I want you to notice here is this little rise in the temperature that occurs at about 11 p.m. and then another rise that occurs about 6 a.m. And uh, I've seen these before in other temperature traces, and they're usually due to uh, cases where the winds have gone calm at the ground and, and then there's a, a kind of a burst of wind, which is sort of like down mixing from air from a loft. And uh, so then warmer air gets mixed down to the ground. And you see the temperature go up here by a degree or two in each case. So when you plot the relative humidity, you can see uh, as fairly standard in the southeastern US or anywhere, you know, at, once the evening starts cooling off, the relative humidity goes up. And then right here, the relative humidity drops, which is partially due to the rise in temperature and perhaps mixing down of a little bit of drier air. And then this relative humidity slowly goes back up again to around 90%. And then again, at this peak here, where the temperature rose again, you saw the relative humidity drop. And then it kind of gradually rises up again. So if I ran the screening model as some kind of an index, what would it tell us about the Gainesville temperature relative humidity trace for the night of January uh, 2012, 29 January. And what you can see is that, uh, and, and, and the screening model actually uses 16 uh, uh, different fuel temperature and moisture combinations. And so uh, here, for example, the zero, it says none of the 16 uh, produce super fog capable of lasting for an hour. Uh, put a time frame on it. And, and then when the humidity's got above 80%, we can see that about 40% uh, said, okay, I can produce super fog that lasted for an hour. Well, then this fell back to nothing uh, at around 11 o'clock at night uh, due to this, uh, this little rise in the temperature here. And then started up again and reached uh, 80 percent. Uh, and then finally, at five o'clock, all all 16 of the um, fuel temperature moisture combinations, in combination with the Gainesville, Florida temperature and relative humidity trace, uh, said yes, uh, super fog for at least an hour. And then after that, uh, it dropped back off and then remained low. So this is telling me that. The uh, super fog um, screening model uh, may have some skill uh, as a forecast tool uh, and, and, and could be um, uh, connected with the, uh, the weather service forecasts of hourly temperature and relative humidity that are available for uh, various stations during the night. And we can use this to develop some kind of an index that can alert man land managers. Uh, okay, um, the super fog problem uh, has uh, uh, captured the interests of uh, some engineers, uh, researchers at the University of California, Res Riverside, and uh, graduate student Christian Bartolome, and a number of other uh, professors. And, um, and so what has happened is that as part of his thesis work, he's developing a laboratory model to see if he can generate super fog. Now remember that my research suggests that super fog forms by the combination of two air masses of different temperatures and different uh, moistures. But basically moist air mass of two widely different temperatures. 
uh, will produce this super fog. And so he has uh, two, uh, two uh, pipes, uh, one which will have the, the cool air coming in, another that has the warm air coming in. And both air masses are not uh, saturated. And then they mix them in this chamber and, uh, and see what happens. Or when they do, they get dense fog. Uh, this is ongoing work. Uh, what you see here is very preliminary, and they have some more work to do. But uh, you can, right here, you know, you can barely see this uh, this upper uh, uh, pipe coming in because the fog is so dense. Um, that raises the question that if we know what the process is, uh, is super fog around us? And I believe it is. Uh, it's around us almost all the time. Uh, this is a uh, uh, stacks from a, a large uh, electric generating station in Alabama. And uh, what you see, this is on a cold uh, uh, February morning. Uh, 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 this is water cloud, which is uh, coming out of this stack, uh, dense water cloud. And here in these two stacks, you can see that uh, perhaps the relative humidity of the air coming out of the stacks is not quite so high. And so it takes a little bit of mixing before the, uh, the air mass be begins to, uh, uh, the moisture begins to uh, uh, develop into fog and, uh, and, and condensation occurs and you have dense water clouds. Uh, here's another esoteric case of super fog. Uh, notice this red right here. Uh, this was taken several years ago in Iceland when they had the volcanic eruption there. And uh, what was happening was that lava was uh, flowing along the ground and melting an overlying glacier. And uh, you can actually see inside a, a cavity in the glacier, and you can actually see the glow of the lava. And, um, and yet the moment that the air, which is, uh, is coming out, because now this very hot rock is melting water, so you have uh, one air mass, which is very moist and at high temperature, is now coming out and mixing with a cool, moist marine air mass. Ideal condition for super fog, and that's what you see right here. Extremely dense white cloud, and, and you can see nothing. So the visibility is probably no more than a few inches in, in this cloud. Well, that includes my tour through 20 years of smoke fog and super fog research. I want to thank you for watching. And if you have some questions, I would be happy to try to answer them if I can. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, Gary. That was real. That was very interesting. Um, I'm sure there should be some questions coming in here in a minute. Uh, we only have a couple right now. We'll go ahead and start with the first couple. And while we're answering those, go ahead and um, type them in, and we'll we'll work our way through the list. Um, Paul Brockoff asks, how are the smoke source locations estimated? How are the, the sor smoke source locations estimated? Um, I, I would imagine what he's asking is, where did I get the smoke temperature combinations that were used to develop the smoke uh, superfog screening model? Uh, those smoke temperature combinations were taken from measurements uh, you, you saw some photographs of, uh, of me and my crew. Uh, uh, we were at prescribed fires in uh, central Georgia and, uh, and then, uh, uh, let's see, one prescribed fire in particular at, 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 the, at the Hitchity, which is also located in central Georgia. And then um, the super fog measurements were taken in my backyard, which is right near Athens, Georgia. Okay. Um, Paul writes in and says, it looks like a series of satellite uh, hotspots. I'm not sure if that's clarifying what the question is. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah Paul, if you, you can maybe rephrase the question, maybe we can get to it. Maybe. Might have, I think the question was written earlier in the presentation, so it might have kind of, uh, yeah, just rephrase the qu question, Paul, and we'll get back to it. Um, Steve Moore wants to know if uh, 30, what about 32-bit Windows 7 for running the system? Uh, that works. That works. 
Okay. We have had much success with 32-bit Windows 7. Uh, Colleen Decker wants to know if the model accounts for stability of the atmosphere. It does. Uh, that is built into the uh, PBP bot. Uh, the model does uh, uh, have a cooling function which develops um, a stable layer uh, near the ground. Uh, the data that we took suggests that this, uh, the, the layer becomes stable very quickly after sunset. Uh, uh, and then the temperatures, say, bet between the valley floor and the valley uh, and the ridge top, uh, there was a lapse rate developed that was about 5 degrees centigrade per 30 meters. And interestingly enough, on, on the, the number of cases that we, we, uh, we observed, once that lapse rate had developed, it tended to remain at that level. Uh, if the temperature dropped at the ridge top, it dropped the same amount in the valley, so that the temperature difference between a ridge top and the valley remained about the same. And so that allowed us to develop a really rather simple cooling parameterization for the model that works quite well. Okay. Um, Joel Curtis has a comment here, and there's some abbreviations, and I'm not sure if, uh, if, I, if I know what they mean, but maybe, they, maybe you can um, get them. But it says, vessels can be tracked by superfog rising through marine ST, as can be seen on VIS satellite on the ocean. Okay, the same principle can work, uh, particularly in, say, like the North Atlantic, where dense fog has been observed, uh, where you can have uh, cold air coming off of, say, ice, and that mixes with the warmer marine air, which might be coming up from the Gulf Stream. And, uh, and so once again, you can have a boundary between those two air masses, and right at that boundary, uh, very dense fog will form. And uh, some of that fog probably has visibilities that drop to, to uh, three meters. Um, but um, uh, I'm not sure about you know, what the visibilities are. I just know that uh, the fog is very dense. Okay. Uh, next question is from Gary um, Curcio. Hopefully I got that right, Gary. What environmental variables can be superfog busters, and can you rank them as to their importance? Superfog busters. Uh, I guess uh, what Gary means by that are, are dissipators, maybe, uh, or or creators. I'm not too sure what what, <laughs> what it means by that, but we, I guess we can take it both ways. Uh, the superfog screening model uh, is really rather simple. It, it takes the uh, temperature and relative humidity of two different air masses. So what is the critical uh, uh, point from a meteorological standpoint is determining what is going to determine the temperature and the relative humidity. On any given evening, like a 24-hour period, uh, the amount of water in the air is not going to change a whole lot. You might lose some due to dew formation, and you might have, uh, you know, maybe pick up if, if um, you know, the, the, the air mass is over a swampy, marshy area. Uh, but the real change is in temperature. And so those things that cause the temperature to drop, uh, clear skies versus cloudiness, for example, uh, uh, time of the evening, uh, even the relative humidity, are uh, really, and, and winds are really the key factor. Uh, now, um, one of the assumptions with the superfog screening model, which really needs to be validated, uh, is, is the assumption that the currently in use weather forecast models like WRF, for example, um, are accurate. And uh, they are modeling the conditions of the nocturnal boundary layer fairly well. Uh, it seems as though the uh, National Weather Service does quite well in the southeast in their forecast for high and low temperature, and I'm encouraged by this. Um, but when you get conditions of near calm conditions uh, during the night, uh, winds become an important factor, uh, particularly, uh, and, and, and there may be a threshold. But 
I guess what I'm trying to get at is that uh, if the models are functioning accurate, accurately uh, in their predictions, you know, the models are going to develop clouds and the models are going to develop the winds and, and actually do all the work. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and that work will be reflected in the uh, surface level temperatures that the model forecasts. And so if that assumption is correct, uh, then all we need uh, is the, uh, or just the two things, the surface uh, temperature and the surface relative humidity, because these two variables already have the uh, complexities of the meteorology built into them. I might point out that one of the things that the superfog screening model does is that when you get toward the warm season, when uh, your, your, your nighttime low temperatures are more like around 70 degrees rather than around 40 degrees, the super fog screening model finds it much more difficult to develop super fog. And that is because the temperature difference between the ambient air and the smoke air is that much smaller during the warm season. And there, and there, there will actually reach a temperature, I think, if, if the low temperature is 80 degrees, which might occur in some places in Florida during the summer times, even if the natural conditions are favoring fog formation, the super fog screening model says that super fog will not develop. So it's an interesting combination. Um, the mathematics of uh, fog formation are built into the screening model. Okay. Um, Sean Lukes has a, uh, a comment. Uh, there's also a question. Uh, the screening model would indicate in Gainesville that the road should be clear at 11 p.m. to midnight, yet the first accidents were at that time. I don't know when the accidents occurred. Okay. Uh, does, does, I don't know, maybe, maybe someone else does. Let's okay. Let's pull that up. Yeah, here's the, okay. Yeah, looking at, at the uh, screening model, basically uh, after 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, I would say that it's serious. So basically from 2 through 5, what I have on here, it's serious. But if the land manager happens to have that uh, graph in front of him, uh, he, he, you know, the, the hour by hour predictions might be wrong, you know, might be off by 10 or 20 percent, but the warning is still there that this is a night that um, one needs to be alert to the possibility. Now, if we can produce this, uh, say, for uh, a large area like the southeast, which I think we can, and we have models that run out to 72 hours in the prediction, uh, now we can answer the question that was asked by the land managers right at the beginning. If I burn tomorrow, will I smoke up a road tomorrow night? And if we have the super fog index, which indicates a danger for super fog, you know, 24 and 48 hours away from the time he burns, um, you know, then he might decide, you know, maybe I'd better wait for another day. Okay. We have a, let's see, uh, Mike, Mike Ward asks, how does your model results compare with LVORI forecast predictions? There would be similarities. Uh, the the primary difference is that the um, uh, the 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 uh, mathematics of the uh, mixing of the air masses, the two different air masses, uh, are uh, uh, explicitly inherent in the superfog screening model, and so um, there will be similarities with Lavori. Uh, there will also be dissimilarities uh, as well. Uh, I, you know, Lavori has a number of the factors that were built into it by Lee Labdis, who was a collaborator and co-worker with me, um, you know, back in the early 1990s before he retired. And, um, and he was working also on the superfog problem. And so that index has a lot of the meteorology that would be related to superfog formation already in it. 
And so there would be a fairly close correspondence. I think the primary difference would be when, uh, uh, you know, as, as you get the seasonal changes uh, in temperature uh, between, say, the winter, spring, and, and spring, summer, for example, uh, Lavori does not have that sensitivity to the uh, uh, differences in temperatures between the two seasons that the Superfog screening model has. So Lavori would probably overpredict the danger of fog in late spring and summer. Okay. Uh, next question from Josh Weiss. What is the relative humidity threshold in PB Piedmont to turn particles from yellow to red? Uh, that is 100%. Uh, PB Piedmont has an algorithm uh, that follows the temperature uh, changes in the valley as well as over the higher ground. Uh, most of our weather stations are located over higher ground. And, uh, and so uh, because PB Piedmont can do that, can follow the temperature changes where the valleys are a little cooler, than the higher ground, uh, it it uh, it keeps track of the relative humidity, uh, so that's how it does it. Okay. And so when rel well, when the relative humidity reaches 100 percent, then it flags it as red. So typically, you'll see the red showing up in a, in a valley basin first. Okay. Okay, the next one's from Alan Long. How's it going, Alan? Uh, pile burning sometimes begins with a dense white cloud of smoke just as pile combustion really starts and as moisture is being driven out of the fuels in a very short period of time. Is this the same effect you've been describing? I think it is. Uh, I remember days of, uh, of burning piles of leaves and, uh, and, and uh, you know, coming to a burning leaf pile and there are flames coming up and, and there's just smoke that's not even visible. And uh, then I just you know, lay over a huge pile of, uh, of leaves where they've just been raked. You know, they have a little bit of moisture in them. And the fire is uh, smothered. And what you see is a dense white cloud. And I am not a bit surprised if that dense white cloud is super fog. Hmm. It's been with us for a long time. OK. Um, Next question is from Mindy Wright. Is PB Piedmont ready to use at the park or forest level on an ongoing basis, or are there any pilot projects ongoing? Um, it's pretty much ready to use. We've, uh, we have uh, stopped the validation work. Um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the mountains and the coastal areas, because uh, originally three models were intended. Uh, there was PB Mountains and PB Coastal Plain. And uh, PB Coastal Plain was developed about probably four or five years now as, as part of a joint fire sciences project. And um, uh, it was never fully tested because we didn't, we were unable to find ways of tracking smoke in these highly remote areas where there were no roads at all. But one of the things we found was that uh, uh, the transition from the, the daytime to the nighttime conditions occurred, again, quite rapidly. And along the East Coast, you have a lot of irregular landforms. You have islands, and you have inlets and bays and so on. And um, as, as evening cooled, the wind, you know, slowly began to respond to, uh, uh, you know, the, the land, uh, land breeze type of phenomenon. and. Uh, but within an hour, the larger scale land breeze of uh, uh, lar over the larger scale land, inland versus the water, uh, literally overtook that and overwhelmed those uh, smaller scale circulations. And so we found that the, the only real additive aspect uh, to PB uh, coastal plain uh, would be in, in inlets, uh, you know, like the, the large inlets in, in uh, North Carolina, for example. But we also found that if we ran models like WARF or, or um, uh, MM5 uh, at, say, a resolution of one kilometer, we, should, we could also pick this up. And, um, and be 
because PD Coastal Plain had, had very large data requirements uh, in order to run it, uh, it just became ap apparent that, first of all, it didn't look like the skill of the model was that great to warrant the enormous uh, effort the land manager would have to use to run the model. And so we decided that uh, we could use PV Piedmont at the coastlines along with a high resolution uh, numerical weather prediction model output and, and be about as good as it's going to get. In the case of the mountains, uh, I was challenged to run PV Piedmont in the mountains and um, there have been two cases where the model was run in the mountains and it did very well in both cases. Uh, so uh, it looks as though, uh, at least for now, uh, PB Piedmont can also be used uh, in the mountainous areas. Uh, certainly more validation uh, would be uh, advisable, but it does look like as a first cut, uh, the model uh, can give us some information. Okay, and this is sort of a follow-up to that, I guess. You can read as, and hopefully I don't screw up this name too bad. Um, I own Ionis Mitsopoulos wants to know if, if this modeling approach could be incorporated into an early operational early warning system for super fog development during a wildfire. No, it has not been. Could it be? Uh, it probably could be. Um, I, I, uh, you know, it, it depends upon the nature of the warning system, uh, depends on the um, uh, maybe some of our efforts, I guess, to uh, come up with a web-based application, but, uh, you know, if someone was developing an early warning system and wanted to uh, build the models into it, um, you know, that would require at this point some collaboration, which uh, we'd certainly be happy to work with them on that. Okay. Um, uh, Paul Brockoff has uh, rewritten the question, so I'll reread that again. Um, for burn unit 1106, there's a series of red dots and yellow dots indicating smoke and smoke fog. A question relates to how the positions of, the, of the, these dots in the landscape are generated. Are they generated by intensive ground measurements or are they generated by satellite images? Oh, um, I, that, I think I've kind of addressed that. That is um, the algorithm uh, that's in uh, PB Piedmont that identifies uh, where the relative humidity has gone to 100% in a model simulation of temperature distribution over the landscape. And if there happens to be a smoke particle in that location, its colors change from yellow to red to indicate the possible co-location of smoke and fog. Okay. Uh, so satellites are not involved. Uh, this is all on a very small scale, which probably is not resolvable by satellite unless uh, you had connections with the military. Okay. Um, Alan Long wrote in and said that he, he believes the accidents were after midnight in the Gainesville incident. Okay, yeah, I, I uh, do not have that information uh, at hand, so I, I don't know. But generally, uh, between the hours and 4 and, and 6.30 a.m. Uh, are usually when uh, the, the situation for uh, super fog is most critical. I just scrolled further uh, down. It looks like a 345 is when the accidents occurred. Okay. Um, and okay, on the, on the graph. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, um, we've gone off quite a bit, so I'm going to get one more question, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up there. There, is, there are a few more questions. I'll, what I'll do is I'll try to get these to Gary, and he can respond to these by email, if that's possible. Um, and so here, this, the last question is from uh, Claudia Standish. Understanding the timing of these super fog events seems critical for planning of prescribed burns. I've been told that in the southeast, burners often ignite through the nighttime, which could be a problem under the right combination of temperature and relative humidity, correct? Information about how quickly the super fog forms seems critical so that there could be some early warnings on the highways. It seems like one needs to post lookouts during those situations to carefully observe the formation of the super fog. Are many folks utilizing your model in the southeast becoming more prevalent? Um, especially if a burn is expected to continue at night. So, you know, is this, in terms of, of maybe just to describe how you could see this modeling work being turned into a field application that field managers could use to 
you know, predict when it might occur and then actually, you know, take some actions to uh, prevent some accidents? Uh, well, I point out that the version of the model it's, that is available uh, on the web, and um, I, I guess um, uh, you said that you were going to make the uh, slide presentation available to the uh, participants, so you would be right. able to go back and find that slide. Uh, the, the, uh, the model can be downloaded. Um, they can also contact me. Uh, when they want to download the model, and I can send along some information that uh, will kind of help them uh, get started. But they can upload the model on their on their own computer and uh, and and run it. And um, uh, and and so in that sense, uh, they can use available data uh, for the model. So the model is already uh, available. Uh, you know, I think there's probably some you know, maybe easier to use platforms that are now available, you know, like making a web-based application that uh, could speed that process up. As regards to the question about the model being used, uh, the model is being used by groups in the Forest Service and also several state agencies that have uh, been involved in collaboration uh, with the model. Apart from that, um, uh, and of course, I've given teaching sessions around the southeast uh, on the model, uh, and um, uh, it kind of depends on on the enthusiasm and interest of uh, of the land managers, because uh, you know it it does require uh, effort to run a, a model this complex. Uh, one thing that we would like to do, like I say, with a web-based application, is is that the complexity is is now the computer's job, 100 percent of the time and um, that will make it a lot easier. Okay. All right, well, Gary, I want to, um, uh, first off, want to thank you, and then just tell the audience that this, this webinar has been recorded, and as soon as this is over, I'll start the process of uploading it, and it will be available probably in about an hour or so on the Advances in Fire Practice webpage, and so you can get a link there and pass it on to whoever you think might be interested. And um, you can also contact me if you have further questions, and I'll forward them on to Gary, or you can... Um, I don't have Gary's email address up here, but you can find him through the, the normal Forest Service routes. Um, but anyway, Gary, this is very interesting. I think this is a, a, a very important subject, and I think it was a very interesting presentation on this. I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Josh. And thank you to everybody else for coming, and uh, we'll see you on the next webinar. Thanks.